My name is Annette Griswold, G-R-I-S-W-O-L-D. Ms. Griswold, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay, thank you. Good. Uh, if you would, just tell the jury a little bit about yourself, uh, where, you, where you grew up and uh, what you do for a living, please. Okay. Um, I grew up in Hampton, South Carolina, and lived there for the first 18 years of my life, graduated from Wade Hampton High School, went away for college at 18, ended up falling in love with the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Over the next two decades, uh, I spent most of that time in Charlotte. That's where I got married. And with the exception of a few years coming back to Hampton and a few years in Columbia for my husband to get his degree, that time was spent in Charlotte until 2012. My dad took ill and he wanted us to move closer to be be near him and my mom needed help taking care of him. So I moved home in 2012 after my father passed away a few months after. I went back on the job search and I'd been out of work for two months helping my mom. So I was looking for a job and ran into a, my friend's father and he told me I should probably check the law firm. I found out that I had a school friend that worked there. So I reached out to her, sent her my resume and she brought it to the right people. And three interviews later, I was working for the firm and I worked as a paralegal and was hired to work for Alec Murdoch. Right. Which firm are we talking about? What everybody refers to as PMPED. Okay. And when did you start working there? July of 2012. And when you started working there, who were you working for? Alec Murdoch. And the entirety of the time that you were there up until the time that he was no longer a partner of that firm, is that who you worked for? That's correct. All right. So how long was that? That was a little over nine years. Were you the uh, only staff member that he had that was assigned to him? No, we have, um, there's two of us that worked for Alec. Um, I had been with him, like I said, the nine years. And then the other secretary was Christy Jarrell, and she had been with him about almost double of what I had been there. Quickly describe for me sort of the division of labor between you and Christy Jarrell, please. I was hired to handle more of the larger cases that Alec had. Um, you know, where it's litigation law and so it's personal injury for the most part, workers comp, medical malpractice, premises liability, product liability, wrongful death, trucking cases. And so he wanted me to take over those bigger cases and handle those. And then Christy did more of the day-to-day -day stuff and the smaller files. Still just as important, but just smaller files than the larger ones. You had the more complex stuff? I did. The bigger cases? Yes, sir. Um, just quickly, uh, how was uh, the defendant um, as a boss and a lawyer? Uh, just, just what were his typical work habits and what was he like in the office? Extremely intelligent when it comes to the law. Um, I respected and admired that in him greatly. Um, he didn't keep normal hours. Um, he liked to float in later in the late morning time or early afternoon. Uh, we always had a running joke. We never knew. We knew that he might not be there all day, but he would always show up right before five o'clock when we were ready to leave. So um, just, you know, kept unset hours pretty. Um, I sometimes call referred to Alec as a Tasmanian devil because when he walked in, no matter what you were doing, you were started spinning because he was just coming through and, you know, shouting everybody's name and ready to get work done when he was walking in the door. So it was like it was kind of confusing, confusing. Um. Let me ask you just a little bit. Uh, the jury's heard some uh, testimony about disbursement sheets and how they work. And can you just remind them very quickly uh, how that works? Who prepares the disbursement sheets and how does that go about uh, taking place? After I find out that a case is settled, I go ahead and start getting my disbursement sheet ready where I can kind of go ahead and expect what the deductions are that are going to come out of it. You know, the attorney's fees, the expenses. Um, anytime you have Medicare or any health insurance, there's typically a lien on that money and we are required by law to pay it back. So I go ahead and start looking into all that, draft the sheet and get everything on it that I know that I'm aware of. And then it goes to Alec and he has to, he makes any changes he needs to. And then he would sign, once he signs off on it, I send it across to our accounts payable department and they cut the checks. Are you from, familiar with what uh, is generally referred to as the boat case? I am. 
And that is the uh, boat wreck that occurred around February of 2019? Yes, sir. Are you aware that uh, the defendant was sued civilly in that particular case? Yes, sir. After the boat case happened, did you notice any change in the defendant's demeanor uh, around the office and about his work habits? I did. Um, he was more distant. Even when he was in the office, he was absent. It was hard to, he's always been hard to sit still and, and get answers from and, um, and to sign our documents and anything that we had put in his office to sign, but it got extremely worse after the boat accident. He was rarely there and when he was, the door was closed and it was almost impossible for us to, to reach him. Uh, even in, he was always on his phone, he was always dealing with something bigger than what we had, what we had going on. As time moved on into the early part of 2021, did that even get worse? It did. He, he would come in lots of times and he was just not his normal self or what his normal self used to be. Um, it was just very tense and um, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just you could tell some, that it was the boat crash was weighing heavy on him and he was it was consuming his life almost it seemed like and he was he was just harder to reach and there was a couple instances where I referred to him as having his ass on his shoulders because that's how I felt it was disrespectful of me to to you know to feel that way and to say that out loud but that's how I felt because he just wasn't his self with us anymore he came in and it was just like yelled our names and and just didn't treat us the same way he did prior to the boat accident. Was the defendant uh, very protective about anyone going into his office? He was. There was often times where he would come in on a Monday and say, who's been in my office? And we'd be like, I don't know, probably the cleaning ladies. Uh, you know, we have no idea. He was, you know, it was very cluttered, very unorganized, but he said he knew where his stuff was. That It was organized in his way. Jury's heard a lot of testimony about this, and just in the interest of time, I'm going to ask it this way. Uh, over the years, in various cases, did the defendant uh, ask you uh, to put disbursements to forge on various disbursement sheets uh, so that settlement checks would be prepared from the trust account made out that way? Yes, sir, he did. Um, I can't remember when it started, but he told me, you know, to put it on forge, and I, me knowing forge consulting was a legitimate company. I would, on the disbursement sheet, I would put Forge Consulting, and he would say, no, it's not Forge Consulting. If I wanted to, to be Forge Consulting, I would have told you Forge Consulting. I want it to be Forge. And I was like, well, I don't understand. Isn't the name of the company Forge Consulting? And he told me that, to, he described it to me. He said, think of it like Forge Consulting is the large company, and Forge is a kind of under that umbrella of it. So he said, Forge Consulting is the big name, and then you have all different things they do, including Forge, which is more like a savings account than a trust. So he would actually get you to change it from Forge Consulting to just Forge? Correct. Even when the across the street at the Accounts Payable Department, they would write the check out to Forge Consulting, I would, lots of times I would have to reach out to them and say, hey, you, you wrote this to Forge Consulting, it, he says it needs to be Forge. And so lots of times they would have to change that. Uh, those checks that he would have on disbursement sheets to get cut, um, made out to forge, uh, would he often uh, talk to you about picking those up personally? Yes, I would ask him if I could go ahead and mail it to um, Michael Gunn at Forge Consulting because he was our contact. And um, he would say, no, you know what, I'm seeing Gunn this weekend. Uh, we're, we're, he's coming out to the farm or we're going to meet halfway tonight and have dinner. He always said that he was going to hand deliver it. So I even got to where I would make file notes in my files. Ellick took check to hand deliver because I was so worried that he was going to lose these checks because he was, you know, a little aloof sometimes and, you know, would leave keys in his vehicle, would lose, misplace a few things. And so I was so worried that these checks were going to get lost and then we would have to do a stop payment and reissue the check. So I started making notes where I would remember that I didn't mail it, that it was actually hand delivered well hand delivered at least from who was telling you it was going to be that's correct yes who was saying that Alec was 
All right, when you're talking about the defendant or Alec Murdoch, do you see him here in the courtroom today? I do. Can you point him out to the jury, please? Yes, he's over in the, it looks like a navy blue jacket. Your Honor, can the record reflect he's, she's identified the defendant? Yes. You mentioned uh, he would say that, uh, oh, I'm going to see Gunn, I'm meeting him halfway, we're going hunting, things like that. What, can tell the jury again, who's Michael Gunn? Michael Gunn is, he's our contact, he's the person we were taught to when it comes to um, trust annuities with, trudge, um, with um, Forge Consulting. And that's the real Forge, correct? That's correct. Not the fake Forge? Not the fake Forge. Moving into the latter part of 2020, uh, did you have any particular issue arise with a disbursement to forge that caught your attention? I did. Tell me about that if you would. Um, I was currently working from home. I'd had surgery on Halloween of 2020, and I was working from home, hadn't come back yet. I was um, planning to come back to the office the following Monday. And on that day, I believe it was December 15th of 2020, um, I got a phone call from the accounts payable department. Nicole called me, and she's one of the ladies that cuts the checks and works for Jeannie Seconder. And she told me that she had just got a disbursement sheet over that Christy had sent over a disbursement sheet in one of my files. It made no sense. She didn't understand it. And I was like, I was confused too, because I was like, why didn't he contact me to do my disbursement? Because I'm kind of protective over my files. If I've worked that file the whole time, I want to finish that file. I want to work the whole process of it and um, actually the disbursement part is my favorite part of the file because I want to be able to have that be there when that client gets their money and gets that closure that they deserve so I thought it was very odd that Christy was drafting a disbursement in one of my files and this was the day you were off work that's correct I was I was working from home and I could still could have been reached but I wasn't until Nicole reached out to me and told me Keep going. Um, she told me, so I look, she sends it to me by email or text, I can't remember, and I reviewed it, and it didn't make sense to me either. There was a line on it that said um, the attorney fees were going, or amount of it was going to forge, and I, I didn't understand how that was happening. And I'd never seen him send um, attorney fees to forge before, and so I didn't know that that was even a possibility. And um, so I called the office and Christy transferred me to Ellick and I spoke to him and asked him about it. And he said, why, why didn't Nicole call you? And I said, well, she doesn't know how to write these checks out because it doesn't make sense to her. She hasn't ever seen a disbursement like this. And he, he said, I'll take care of it. And so he said, I'll call Nicole, I'll take care of it. And so I remember um, talking to Nicole later and say, so what did he say? What was the reason behind it? And she said, he said that they um, structure they can structure their attorney fees and that's what that check was for did you have a subsequent discussion with the defendant about that i did and he told me the same thing he said it was something that they've been able to do forever he just never took advantage of it before and so now he decided that he was going to start structuring those attorney fees where it would make interest have interest drawn and so it made sense because why not why not instead of having that money sit somewhere put it somewhere where it's going to draw more money his explanation to you made sense. Yes, it did. On its face. Yes. Do you remember the name of that case? Uh, that was the Hirschberger case. I'm going to show you. Stand by. I'm going to show you what's already been admitted to evidence the state's 429. And uh, see if you recognize this document. Yes, I do. This is the disbursement that was on in December of 2020 that I was talking about. Okay. All right. Thank you. Put it up on the screen. Uh, at that point in time, we're in December of 2020, is that right? 
That's correct. After the defendant gave you that explanation that seemed valid to you on your face, did you did that matter just kind of go away at that point in time? It did. It was kind of, you know, always at the back of my mind because I still felt like there should have been some kind of paper trail. But, yeah, you know, the explanation worked that he gave me. And so I was trying to just go along with it because I thought it was valid. Uh, as we move on into January 21, 2021, did another incident happen that came to your attention as related to this person? Yes, um, the end of January, um, it was a Friday afternoon. I left early that day to take my mom to, to the eye doctor and kind of the same scenario of, of kind of an exact repeat of December happened again. Nicole from Accounts Payable called me and, she, and I said, what's going on? And she said, well, I've got another one. And, and so Christy had drafted a disbursement in a case referred to as Moore. And um, she had sent it over and once again, it had the same wording and kind of confusion that the one, the Hirschberger one had a, a month previous. So she didn't really understand it again. Still, you know, still, she was still trying to say, you know, I, I feel like we need more information on this. And I said, I do too. And so, kind of the same scenarios before I reached out to Alec, he reached out to Nicole and ultimately the checks got written. Um, but it was the same scenario as you can see on here, the 91,867.50 was um, attorney fees that were structured that went straight to Forge to the fake, what we now know is, was the fake Forge. All right, and uh is that still in the Hirschberger matter you're talking That's about? That's the Hirschberger one. And on the Thomas Moore one, it we'll, we'll was... We'll get there in a second. Okay. When you got that call, do you remember where you were, the second call? Yeah, the Thomas Moore, I was at the eye doctor with my mom. Right, I'm, I'm still in Hirschberger. Do you remember where you were on that Oh, second? I was home. I had had surgery, and I was home recovering. Right. And I'm going to... show you this uh, and we're still in the same exhibit that being 429 do you recognize that at all let me let me hand this exhibit to you just take a foot through it if you would please absolutely Yeah, this is um, what we refer to now as the second Hirschberger disbursement. Um, it was on the UIM portion of the case and liability portion. Um, so once again, the PMP attorney's fees were routed to Forge in the amount of $83,333.33. All right, you'd start to talk about uh, Thomas Moore. Is that another incident that came to your attention as we're moving uh, into early 2021? Yes, sir. That one, like I said, was at the end of January. Uh, once again, I was out of the office. I was at a doctor with my appointment with my mom. Got the call from Nicole. She said it's the same scenario. The, the, but this time it was all the funds that was in tr client's trust, which was $125,000, I believe. And all those funds were being routed. That was attorney fees and client money that was being routed to um, the fake forge. And this was another one of your cases, is that right? It was. So another situation where I'm out of the office, it's almost five o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. Christy drafts the disbursement, Alex signs it, they send it over in my absence. When these instances are happening that you're describing to the jury where you happen to be out of the office and all, these are your cases, right? That's correct. And all of a sudden you're getting communications that the defendant is having Christie draft some disbursements. In any of these cases, were was there anything going on that something happened and had to be done that very day that you just happened to be out of the office? I didn't think so because um, in particular the Thomas Moore case, it was we were working on the third party portion of the case but there was also a workers' comp portion that another attorney was working on. And when you're working on a workers' comp case, if you settle the third party first, you can't disperse it until the workers' comp portion is taken care of because workers' comp always 
has a huge lien that you have to negotiate for the client. So the money was supposed to sit there. It was my understanding it would probably be sitting there another year until the workers' comp portion case, portion of the case was settled. So those funds didn't need to go anywhere. So it was very odd that all of a sudden they're, they're all sent to forge because they were supposed to remain in the account was my understanding. Do you uh, take pride in the work that you do on these complex cases? I do. Do you know your cases very well? I, I'd say I do. And did, was there any reason of which you were aware that things things have, had to be happening the day that they were? Spoke? I did. No, I was. It, it definitely put up another yellow flag, and it made me think about the previous one that happened in Hirschberger in December, because both of them were this, kind of the same scenarios. Me out of the office, someone else drafting it, and not that we are we can't work in each other's files. We can, but. It's easy to miss something if it's not your file. Um, if I had to go in somebody else's file and draft a disbursement, I may not know that there's a lien or a, or a certain promised medical bill or anything else that needs to be paid. So it's, that's why, to me, it's, it's easier if somebody that's worked the case actually drafts a disbursement because they know all the deductions that have to come out. Was the defendant using the opportunity of you being out of the office to push these things through. Yes, in hindsight, it was easy to see that the, the chaos, the sending it over at, you know, 10 minutes before 5 p.m. was kind of, you know, kind of a, a way of part of that little hurricane, a little tornado portion, you know, just sending it over when most people are gone and it's just gonna get done quickly and no questions asked. You said that the Thomas Moore line was particularly unusual because it was workers' comp and those funds couldn't be dispersed yet, correct? correct? To your understanding. Yes, sir. Did you ever have a conversation with the defendant about why these funds were dis uh, were dispersed? I did, and he explained to me that he had gotten permission that since the money was going to be sitting there another year, um, that they were going to send it to Forge and let it draw interest, and then that would be money that that would draw interest on for the client as well as the firm because it was both portions of the money. I'm going to show you what's already been admitted into evidence of States 328 and see if you recognize this document. Yes, this is the Thomas Moore disbursement that I'm re referring to that where the entire client um, trust amount of $125,000. Do you recognize the signature down at the bottom of the page? I do. Alex signed it where it says R. Alexander Murdoch, and then where the client signature is, I'm, that is not the client signature. It's it's Alex's handwriting. You recognize this handwriting from working for him for nine years? I do. Did, uh, did the defendant have a, a case going on around this time uh, involving Mack Trucks? He did. Um, what we refer to as the Ferris case. We actually went to Columbia and had a bench trial in that case in January of 21. Right. And did you uh, work on that case to some extent? I did. Okay. Was that one of the ones assigned to you? Yes. Did, was the defendant the only lawyer on that case, or were there other lawyers? No, there was two co-cancels that had um, brought us in. Um, Wayne Ridgeway was the first attorney that received that case. He um, reached out to Chris Wilson's office, and Chris joined the case as well, and then Chris reached out to our firm, and so now there's a third attorney, which was Alec, involved in it. Ultimately, was that case tried before a judge? It was. Bench trial, like I said, in January of 2021. And did the judge issue a verdict in favor of uh, the firm's clients? Did, yes, sir. And um, the next month, I think sometime in February, we got a very nice verdict for the clients. Uh, who was going to be dispersing the fees in that uh, once the money came in? Was that going to be PMPED or was it going to be the other attorneys? Chris firm? Wilson's office. Um, had the firm PMPD had it accrued costs in the course of that litigation? Yes. Expenses? Yes. And did you prepare those and send those to Chris Wilson's office or how did that work? I did. I put the totals in an email and sent them to, um, Ellick wanted me to send him the totals by email and so that's what I did. And then he, I guess he sent them to Chris after that. 
right. And then after that happened, do you remember what month the money came in roughly? In May. Um, well, let me, let me slow you down. Once you've done that, when the money comes in, you said Chris Wilson's office is going to be handling that disbursement, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. What are you expecting to happen next? I'm expecting copies of the settlement paperwork, you know, copies of the disbursement sheets signed by, signed by the client, and I'm expecting um, two fee checks and two expense reimbursement checks because there's two cases. It's a, it was a case for the, for the deceased and a case for his wife. So I'm expecting four checks total. And you're about to say, and I cut you off, you said something happened in May. Did something happen in, related to the Ferris case in May? Yes, um, I received by mail um, a, the settlement package from Chris Wilson's office, but all it contained was a cover letter and the two expense reimbursement checks. So I emailed Vicki Lyman, which is Chris Wilson's secretary, and said something on the something like, hey girl, I got these expense checks in, when can I expect the attorney fee checks? And she replied to my email telling me that, um, <coughs> excuse me, hey friend, you know our, the, the attorney's got that money at disbursement. And I was really shocked because I didn't even know when the disbursement took place. I was never supplied copies of it or anything. What's your thought when you, uh when Vicki says that, what, what, did, what did you think may have happened? Well, I, I called her and I said, you know, you already gave the checks. I was like, we, I don't think we've received them. And she was like, yeah, they, they were done at disbursement in March. And so I asked her first to send me over copies of the disbursement sheets and where I could look at those. And then I reached out across to our accounts payable just to make sure that checks somehow bypassed me and went straight to their into the client trust to their department and they told me no that they didn't have any such checks on the books either and I was like okay so I assume that they gave Ellick the checks and he's lost them they're misplaced they're somewhere in his truck they're somewhere in a file folder stuck and just kind of hid away that and he's forgotten to give them to me did you say that to Becky like come on why would you give yeah. them to my I said, boss why I said why would you do that I was like why would you give checks to the attorney why wouldn't you send them straight to me where i can get them and get them deposited <laughs> i'm going to put uh states 312 that's already in evidence and this is the page uh mark bait stamp 2371 for the record up on the screen can you see that on your little screen do i need to bring i can that i can see it and can you tell the jury what that is that is the email i was talking about where i told her i just got the expenses but where's the fee and she says it's because your boss and mine and Liz's got their fees once they were signed, duh. Uh, did you uh, have a conversation with Alec at this point, or what did you do next? I did. So you um, called, you called the finance in your own firm and said, hey, did we get this check? And they correct. said no. They said no. And right. so I verified that. And then I told, I asked Vicki, I said, are you positive? And she said yes. And I was like, OK, I'll go see if he remembers where they're at. So. He happened to be in the office by that time. His door was closed. I went in, he was on the phone, and I kind of kept checking and going back. Eventually, I got to speak to him, and he, he was still kind of on the phone, but he was like, no, I didn't get those checks. And I was like, are you sure? And he said, yeah. And I was kind of back and forth, and I'm like, you said he didn't get them, are you sure? And this kind of went back and forth for a few minutes and um, over the course of the, the rest of the day. and. I said, hey, he just told me that Chris was still holding those funds in trust. I was like, I don't understand, you know, you say that they've been cut. I was like, can you send me copies of stuff? Because I don't see anything. And he's telling me their funds are in trust. And she was like, Annette, I know for a fact that the checks are cut. There is no money in trust. And the reason I know that is because when the checks were written to Ellick, I knew it was a bit odd because they were written to Richard, Richard they were written out to him personally instead of the firm. And I said, I'm there. They were written out to him personally instead of the firm. Correct. Why did that stick out in her mind? Why that, well, why did that stick out in your mind? It, because common sense tells me that the attorney fees belong to the firm, where the firm, I don't know, I didn't understand the complete breakdown until Jeannie went over it in her testimony, but I knew by common sense that the funds belong to the firm. And then once they do whatever percentages and everything they need to do, then the, the attorney gets his portion later. 
So I knew it wasn't right, that it shouldn't have never gone to the, an individual attorney. It should go to the firm as a whole. When you asked the defendant, said, hey, Vic, Vicky says you already got those, and he tells you what? He told me that Chris was holding that money in trust, that it had not been dispersed yet. Did he tell you Vicky's wrong? Yeah, he told me Vicky's wrong. I don't care what she's telling you, she's wrong. What was his demeanor when you were inquiring, you know? Just kind of like, you know, just shooing me out of his office, like, I don't have time for this. Uh, after Vicky tells you that the it was odd because the checks had been made out to the, the defendant personally instead of the law firm, what did you do next? Um, I asked her, I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. And I, she said, yeah, it was written out to him. Well, first I was like, I'm sorry, what did you say? And I made her repeat it to make sure I heard correctly. And she was like, and then kind of while she was saying it out loud, I think it kind of registered to her, oh wait, that probably wasn't the right thing to do. Cause she kind of hushed after that and didn't want to talk and kind of wanted to get off the phone with me. And so I still kind of tried to question Ellick over the next couple of days and tried to get a reasonable explanation of what was going on. Because in my mind, you know, I'm still hoping this, he just lost the checks and this was all just a, a misunderstanding. But at the back of my mind, you know, there's this huge, huge red flag telling me this is not right. You know, what, what is going on? Did you eventually uh, take this issue to anyone else since you couldn't get an answer about it? Yes, um, I eventually, um, I don't know the exact date, but I eventually emailed Jeannie Seconder and asked her if she was in the office because I really needed to speak to her. And um, she said she would be back later that day. And so we, I went into her office and I had everything printed out and kind of showed her and told her my concerns and she was instantly on <clears throat> excuse me on high alert as well because you know it was it didn't look good we were hoping we were still both hoping that it was a misunderstanding just this one-off something silly that happened but we both had that nagging feeling of this is not good Something is definitely wrong. Did Jeannie instruct you to do anything? Um, she did not. She said that she would talk to him about it, and she kept the paperwork that I gave her. Right. Were you ever asked to send another email to Vicki asking for particular documents? Yeah, actually, it was kind of my idea. I kind of told Jeannie, I was like, hey, you know, why don't we do this? Why don't you send me an email telling me what, we're need, what we need, and then I'll forward that email from myself and you know to see if we can get copies of everything where we can figure all this out and eliminate it because you know at this point we want to prove that that suspicion we had was wrong and that everything's really okay so um she did she forwarded me an email and it, i'm still on uh, states 312 what's been bait stamped is 2374 and is this the email that you just described that Jeannie uh, forwarded to you requesting the documentation for the uh, Ferris fees? It is. Um, underneath where, um, yeah, Jeannie texts there or emails there and tells me exactly what she needs and kind of is very specific. At what time, what date was that, I'm sorry? That was May 27th at 1140 a.m. All right. And then going over to 2373 in the same exhibit, is this... Uh, the email right here that you then forwarded to Vicki Lyman at Chris Wilson's office? Yes, it was, um, I emailed, forwarded that email that Jeannie sent me on the same day, May 27th, and I knew she was on vacation, but I went ahead and sent this to her, and then when she came, when I knew she had time to get back from vacation, I sent this um, follow-up on the strand on June 2nd and requesting it again. All right. And... Did you get a response email from Vicki Lyman and Chris Wilson's office? Yeah, she said she didn't, you know, this doesn't involve her and she forwarded it. She said she would forward it to Chris. And we were basically just asking for copies of everything where we could clear this matter up and, you know, like I said, we, we wanted our suspicion to be wrong.
show you what's been marked as Exhibit 440 to your testimony. And again, just tell me, first of all, just if, without going into any content, whether or not you recognize that particular document. I do. It's a text strand between myself and Vicki Lyman. All right. And is this, uh, what, what is the date on that particular text strand? June 2nd, and then it runs into June 3rd. And is that 2021? Yes, I'm sorry, 2021. And is this a text thread where y'all are discussing the things that you've described here today? Yeah, I told her I just, you know, don't mention it anything. Hold on, just real quick. Okay, I'm sorry. Y'all are describing what we're talking about here today? That is correct. All right, Your Honor, at this time I would uh, move stage 440 into evidence. Your Honor, object on hearsay grounds. It doesn't fall within an exception to the hearsay rule. Let's see the document. Yes, sir. Did you ultimately uh, text uh, Vicki uh, on that particular day? I did. <clears throat> I told her that um, I gave her time to get back from vacation and I just basically texted her with my concerns and told her how stressed out I had been over this situation and how I was hoping my suspicion was wrong, but I was really stressed out. And um, unfortunately, my daughter, we had, me and Vicki had talked on the phone. Vicki had called me as well. And unfortunately, my daughter had overheard me too. So she instantly got like really worried for me. And my daughter said, um, Mom, you need to go ahead and get your resume because once you turn all this in, they may fire you. All so right, she was very concerned for me. And this uh, latest email on the screen, that was June 2nd, 2021. Is that That's correct. correct. You recall June 7th, 2021? I do. Was that a Monday? It was. Were you at work that day? I was. Did the defendant come to work that day? He did. He came in um, probably around lunchtime. I can't remember if he came in before lunch or after, but some, somewhere in that time frame. Did you see Jeannie Seconder that day? I did. Um, Jeannie had already told me that she needed to, she was going to talk to Ellick about the Ferris um, e checks that were missing. She was going to go and talk to him about them that day, um, and so she asked me to let him, let her know when he got into the office. So when he got to the office, I reached out to her to let her know. And did she come up to you, to your area? She did, and we have open style um, offices, no doors on the secretary door, secretary's offices. So um, she had to pass by me to get Ellick's office. So I saw her when she was walking past. Did she give you any look when she walked out? She did. It was kind of just like that, you know, just kind of a raised eyebrow, like, wish me luck, here goes nothing kind of look. Like, I hope, you know, because we were both just, like I said, wanting to get answers and... Get answers about what? About those missing checks and figure out what was going on. Where did she go after she gave you that look? Um, I heard Alex's doors closed, so I assumed in his office to talk to him. This is what day? This is June 7th, 2021. Uh, did she come out after? She did, and she didn't stop. She just hurried by my desk, and she went on about her business. Did you have any conversation yourself about the Ferris fees with the defendant that day? I uh, don't recall having any discussion with him on that day. At that point, I turned, you know, Jeannie had everything and it was kind of in her hands. What time do you think you left work that day? I left at 5.15 that day. Is that your normal time? It's not, I typically work later. Ellick always tend to work nights and me and Christy tend to kind of adapt to his schedule a little bit and work a little later than five o'clock. Both, most of the time we were there till 5.30, six o'clock. When, uh... When you left the office on June 7th, 2021 at 515, was the defendant still there? He was. Did you go home? Okay. Eventually? Eventually went home? Yes. Just a normal night? Yeah, I went straight home that night. Did that change at some point? Uh, yes, it definitely. Um, my phone was on silence and I, was, I slept through a bunch of text messages and calls 
I woke up in the middle of the night and my phone was just full and I was like, what is going on? And so um, I'm looking through the text messages. They don't make a lot of sense. I see I have a voicemail message from, from Randy Murdoch. And so I checked the voicemail and, and I could tell he was upset and crying and he said, Annette, please call me when, when you can. It doesn't matter what time. And so I don't remember what time it was, but it was sometime in the middle of the night and I called him. And he told me, <clears throat> well, when, when, I, when he answered the phone, he was, he was upset obviously. And I said, Randy, what's wrong? And he said, it's bad in it, it's real bad. And I said, oh no, Mr. Randolph passed. And he said, no, it's not, it's not dad, it's Maggie and Paul. And I said, what? And he said, they've been shot and murdered. And I said, what? And it was just, it was very overwhelming. I'm, we both cried on the phone with each other. And, and you know, obviously the first thing I did was say, oh my God, how is Alec? You know, how is he, is he okay? Where's Buster, is Buster okay? I was very concerned. You know, I had a million thoughts running in my head. I was like, are you guys safe? You know, is this something aimed at the entire family? You know, and I was very, very worried about Alec and Buster and Randy and his family and, and the entire Murdoch family. So it was, um, it was very overwhelming. Uh, over the nine years of being, working closely for the defendant, did you also get to know his family, Maggie and Paul and Buster? I did. Is this firm uh, pretty tight knit? Yes. What was the reaction of the people in the firm to this terrible news? There was two reactions. First was scared. We we were like, please lock our doors. Um, you know, we're scared. Who is the same dad? Is it a client retaliating? Um, is it you know aimed at Ellick? Is it aimed at the firm? We didn't know. We just had so many questions, no answers, a million thoughts running through our heads. We were just there, you know, supporting each other and helping one another through this grieving process. And at the same time, we were very protective over Ellick and Randy. We wouldn't let them leave the office if strange cars were driving around. We would say, don't walk out yet. There's a white car that's went around three times. I mean, we were in complete mama bear mode. We were, we were just we didn't want them to go out and have to talk to reporters. We didn't want them to have to run out and run into anybody. And we were scared for them. We were, we were very protective. I mean, we, anything suspicious out the window, we were on high alert. <laughs> said, uh, what kind of mode? Mama bear mode. Mama bear, bear protecting who? Protecting Ellick and Randy. Did that, did the law firm community rally to the aid of the defendant? They did. Was that the primary focus of it on everybody's mind in oh, the abs aftermath? Absolutely. Were you at all concerned about finding out what happened to these Ferris fees after that happened? What Ferris fees? <laughs> what Ferris fees? Yeah, what Ferris fees. Uh, and that was the furthest thing on my mind. Back. Was that the last time you really thought about it in any any aspect until September of 2021? It is, yes, sir. And you were more focused on helping this defendant and his family in the aftermath of this tragedy that had happened. Yes. And everybody was so supportive. I mean. Some of our, the associate attorneys stepped up and they came up to me and Christy and said, hey, you know, if you need anything over the next few weeks, you need us to review a file for you, get something else, sign it and get it out the door. We're here for you guys 100%. So it wasn't, you know, we were supportive. And then we had other folks in the office that were coming up to us, supporting us as well, because they knew we were at a standstill. What do we do? You know, because we knew obviously he was not going to be the same and not be himself for quite a while. I asked you earlier about the boat case. Before the murders, when the boat case happened, had there been some 
reaction and backlash in the community against the defendant and his family after the boat case? Yes, it was very difficult because Hampton being a small town, we all know each other and we're all, we all know both sides for the most part. For instance, um, Mallory Beach, her father is my first cousin. So Mallory Beach, I was kind of felt like I was in between a rock and a hard place because, you know, her family is, you know, beyond heartbroken over the loss of her. And then, and I know some of them didn't like the idea that I was still working at the firm, but I was still, I, to me, it was two separate entities. This is my job. This was my family. And I, I had to keep them separate. I didn't want any part of the boat wreck case. I didn't want to know any details or anything because like I said, I was keeping my family life and my work life separate. Um, after the murders, you said the law firm community, though, rallied to Alex Aid, correct? Absolutely. Everybody. Did the larger community do as well? Yes, they did. After the murders? Yes, sir. You mentioned that after those murders happened, what Ferris fees? They were the farthest thing from your mind, correct? Yes, sir. <clears throat> when did they come back to your attention? Uh, <clears throat> September 2nd, it was a Thursday um, in the afternoon, and I was looking for a file in the file cabinet, and I was unable to locate it, and lots of times if, you know, Alex talking to a client on the phone, he'll yell for a file, and we'll take it to him. So I was like, oh, it's probably in his office. So I went to his office to look for the file, and when I found it, I picked it up, and when I did um, a check kind of, floated like a feather to the ground. And when I bent over to pick it up, I saw the check and what it said and had on it and I instantly became very upset because it happened to be one of the checks from the Ferris case that didn't exist. And what did you see on the check that let you know that stuck out in your mind? It was from Chris Wilson's office. It was written to Richard Alexander Murdoch, and at the bottom it said Ferris fees. And, and it was you, dated March. <laughs> and so what did you realize at that I point? I said, well, I said, he's been lying this whole time. He had these funds. He lied to me. Oh, my, that feeling in the back of my mind was correct. Unfortunately, he did take these funds because when I flipped the check over, I also saw that he had deposited by mobile deposit and, and I can't remember if he signed the back of the check or if it just said mobile deposit only. Let me show you stage 313, see if you recognize that. It's already in evidence. Yes, sir, that's the check that I found on September 2nd. Right. And uh, if you flick up the uh, one side or the other side. Yeah, it's got his signature, uh, his signature, Bank of America deposit only. You recognize that writing as the defendants? Yes, it is. When that check fluttered down, you picked it up? I you did. You saw that? Where did you take it? Did you take it anywhere? Yeah, I went back to my desk and you can imagine I was all the emotions that I was feeling at this point. You know, I was I was hurt, I was angry. I just was beside myself and I was I was a bit enraged too because I asked him so many times, there were so many times that I felt like we could have clarified this and got it taken care of, but here it is from March to September and I find this check that supposedly did not exist. And so I, um, I went to my desk, I called Jeannie and I was like, I just found something. And she said, oh shit, <laughs> what did you find? And I said, are you busy? And she said, come on over. And I went over and closed her door and threw the check at her and, I, and she was like, is this one? I said, yeah, that's one of the fairest checks that doesn't exist. Was Jeannie doing any, uh, anything else or start doing anything else when you came down with that check? I didn't know it until I took her the check, but when I took her the check, she was like, yeah, I just ran a report yesterday. And she said, um, we're gonna, one of the attorneys is gonna call Michael Gunn later today. And I said, well, what, you, what do you mean? And that's when she told me that she thinks there's some more stuff too. Back to my suspicion with Hirschberger and Thomas Moore, she pulled a report and she found out that we may have other issues of stolen funds. 
but I was not aware of any of that. I didn't know that she was looking into it again. I didn't know any of that until I took her the check and she said she had just started doing stuff within the last few days. Within a few days of this happening, what happened to the defendant's uh, employment at the law firm? He was fired the next day. And did the law firm engage in a review process to determine the extent of any alleged Yes, we've had months, um, months upon months of, of going through all of the files and finding, you know, just following the numbers and making notes on everything and it, lots of hours, lots of manpower in, involved in this process of putting everything together and just in awe of how much was happening and we had no, no idea about it. Without going through all the exhibits that we're going through with Jeannie Seconder, but she was the one or one of the central ones in doing that review. Is of that correct? Of course, yes. And without going through each one, is a lot of those disbursements for the fake forge account, those were disbursements that the defendant told you to put on there? That's correct. Are those a lot of those disbursements, one where he corrected you and said, no, don't put forge consulting, put forge? Yes, they were. A lot of those checks, ones where he said, oh, I'm going to see Michael Gunn later, I'll take the check myself. Yeah, they were all for him. show you what's been marked as exhibit 441 again without going into the contents uh, tell me if you recognize that document yes this uh, text message that Alex sent to me and Christy on September 26 when he was in 2021 when he was in um, rehab is my understanding all right your honor this time I'd offer uh, states 441 in the evidence I believe without objection no objection submitted without objection Your Honor, I apologize. We we do have the 403 objection and subject to the court's prior ruling on this. I haven't seen the exhibit. I don't. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have you go to the jury room for a break. Please do not discuss the case. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Uh, Griffin. Yes, Your Honor. I'm just preserving our prior objections on 404B evidence under 404B and 403. And this, it, it's nothing new. I, I just forgot to state no additional objections than what we've already had in this line of testimony, which is this is the same line of testimony of financial misconduct. That's all. Yes, sir. 
Waters. And I just clarified, I think, with defense counsel that he was not adding a specific 403 objection to that. It's just the prior objection. However, this is uh, a text uh, from the defendant to this witness in this particular instance. Certainly, it can be read, and it's, uh, it's, there's no hearsay issue because, obviously, it's a statement of a party opponent. And it certainly also is relevant uh, because it uh, can certainly be read in the nature of an admission uh, to the various uh, uh, things that are at issue in this, these particular proceedings. Uh, and for that reason, uh, and there's certainly the probative value of an admission is certainly, uh, I would argue, is um, uh, the probative value of that is not substantially outweighed by the danger of any unfair prejudice. It introduces another issue, the issue of drug use. And, and um, I think the witness testified that he was in rehab. Is that what you said? that he was in rehab and sent an email and um, And just want to be clear from the defense, the, the part of, it, of the testimony that establishes through this witness that he was in rehab, that is not a basis for your objection? We do have, uh, yes, we do object to evidence of his drug use and to be included in this, and we would ask that that document be redacted to the extent it references um, rehab at this it time. It doesn't specifically re mention drug use. So uh, have you all review the exhibit and tell me if, if you just, if you have no objection based on uh, the fact that he sent it while in rehab, then, uh, then it's admissible as far as your prior yes. bad acts objection. We don't have any additional objections, Your Honor. We would, because this does raise an additional character if you ask the court. We ask that the court give, you know, additional limiting instruction um, at some point in time. About that. that is the character in that he saying he's getting better, or what, what part addresses character? Well, certainly he says I'm getting better every day, and, and I mean, it's, it's clear from that that he's in rehab. I mean, I, that's all. All right, Mr. Waters. I, Your Honor, I mean, he doesn't expressly say that. I, I would point out that the issue of, uh, of pills has already come up a few times in this trial. I'm not trying to go there, but it is, uh, when we talk about 404 and, and rest just day, it is kind of part and parcel uh, of a lot of things. I mean, even the defense has examined, I believe, Ms. Seconder on the issue of pills. Uh, and on top of that, you know, we, we had uh, Chris Wilson, um, who testified in camera, uh, who will also uh, testify here today. You know, one of the things he says when he uh, had that confrontation with the defendant on the uh, morning, or excuse me, the afternoon, I believe it was September 4th, that the defendant said, yeah, I've been stealing money and I've, I've been hooked on pills for a while. So uh, this is a bridge I think we have to, to cross at some point. Uh, the state is not trying to gild the lily with that, uh, but at least, um, you know, with these various witnesses, it is part of what they're being said. As far as that specific exhibit, though, your Honor, uh, there's no express reference to drugs or anything like that, and it certainly is in the nature of admission. And, and again, I think for that reason, it's uh, very probative and very relevant and, and admissible for that reason. Well, my concern, obviously, is that we do not, um, or that I do not allow testimony involving these admissions to bleed so far into the character uh, 403 that it, it it has 
has the effect of undoing uh, uh, the 403, 404, 403 analysis. Um, I, a lot of testimony has come in unobjected to uh, that touches upon the defendant's character. Um, that's why I want to be clear on what the objection is. Uh, Your Honor, from the state's perspective, we are trying to, uh, you know, walk that line. I mean, there's a lot of the financial stuff we're not even seeking to admit. Uh, I think that, you know, we've, we've limited it to things that had that connection that we discussed in, in camera. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to gild the lily. Uh, we, um, I'm not sure what that means. That's a, that's a phrase I learned from Chief Justice Toll uh, over the years. I guess that means, uh, you know, um, piling on, I guess, is a way to, to, to do that. And again, I, I don't have, you know, we, we recognize the situation we're in and trying, obviously, not to get out over our skis from, from what the uh, admissibility of, uh, that the court has already ruled on. Uh, uh, I ponder it while we take the, our break, and we'll be in recess for about 15 minutes. Ma'am, you may step down. Do not discuss your testimony. Thank you. Uh, the objection is overruled. The exhibit is at, admitted. May it please court, Your Honor. Just very quickly, when we left, left off states 441, now admitted into evidence, this was a text you received from the defendant. Is that right? That's correct. And the date on that is September 26th? September 26th, yes. Is that 2021? It is. Is this the text of that text that the defendant sent to you? It is. I only have a couple more questions for you. Before I get to the end, one question I wanted to ask you was, can, what, what was the defendant's cell phone usage like? He was always on his phone. Always on his cell phone, always on his office phone. He would quit one conversation and grab another. Sometimes he would have both phones to his ear. Would it be unusual for the defendant to go anywhere without a cell phone with him? Absolutely. I want to play for you what's been admitted to evidence as States 297. Can we have the, uh, this input, please? recognize any voices in that video? I do. I hear three voices. And tell me who you hear. I hear Paul Murdoch, Maggie Murdoch, and Elliot Murdoch. And how sure are you? I'm 100% sure. Can I have the Elmo one more time, please? I'm sorry. Oh. Going back to States 441, can you read? Just that one sentence starting where my finger's pointing that the defendant sent to you. The worst part is knowing I did the most damage to those I love the most. Thank you. Cross examination.
Good morning. <clears throat> Ms. Griswold, you um, were you hired by Alec to work at at the law firm? I was hired by the firm, but he was in one of the meetings that, and it was my understanding that I was going to be working for him. Right. And, and so you interviewed with him? I did. And you've been working, well, you, you worked with him for? Um, nine, about nine years. Nine years. Yes, sir. And one second left. back to Hampton because your you had uh, your father was ill. my father was ill yes sir and and then um, so you moved your family back you and your husband and right my husband and my daughter and I moved to be closer to my dad and help my mom with him and 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 you got a job working at the law firm and, and did you work exclusively for mr. Alec Murdoch most yes I mean there was other attorneys that I might do some work for here and there, but primarily Ellick was who I, who my attorney was. And, and if you needed to take time off um, to, for personal matters, would you, would you just have to run it by Ellick? That's, that's correct, yes sir. And, um, and he put family first at work, did he not? Most of the time, yes. And, and he encouraged you to put your family first? Absolutely. And, and, and I think your father, excuse me, your husband had a heart attack. He was in the hospital for quite some time. Yes, for five weeks before he ultimately passed away. And I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. But Alec encouraged you to do all you needed to do to care for him and don't worry about work. Isn't that right? Yes, he did. And you didn't miss a paycheck? I sure didn't. Was he a good person to work for? It was, it was hit or miss. I, I cared about him. I respected him. I loved him. You know, you can't be that close and work with somebody without having, you know, feeling, developing feelings for them and their family members. Right. Um, but it was hard to work for him sometimes. He, he, was, a, he was a bit erratic and, yeah, I, for, you know, for all the respect and love I had for him, it was still very difficult to work for him. I think your description was he was like a Tasmanian devil that would come through <laughs> at the end of the day. He would. <laughs> and he was frenetic. Yes. Okay. And uh, uh, but people came to him if they needed something, right? Absolutely. Yes, sir. And and so he had a lot of people coming. And and did, did he ever say no to anybody's request? He didn't know the word no. Right. And um, well, he would want to schedule his appointments around his family's um, commitments, wouldn't he? Yeah, absolutely. So like if the um, Buster and Paul were, had baseball season, he'd be sure to block all that out off his calendar, wouldn't he? Most of the time. Sometimes he didn't tell us about personal matters or things where they were going until the day of or whatever, but, and we would have to reschedule stuff. But if it was on the calendar, yes, he was going to be there for, for anything that the boys had going on. He put in his work life family first. Is yes, that right? that's correct. You, you would agree with that? I would definitely agree with that. And um, and and you got to know Maggie. Did I you did. Know? And, yes, sir. And she was thoughtful for you on your birthday and anything you had going on. Absolutely, yeah. And and I think you mentioned the the Ferris trial in Columbia. Um, that that was in Columbia, wasn't it? That was, yes, sir. And and you went to the trial, didn't you? I did. And um, and you remember Alec um, going up on a Sunday, and he spent the night in the hospital because his dad was going to have surgery the next day. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. It seems like that's it's, it's been a and long then, time, but yeah. Right. Yeah. And then and then Maggie came up on Monday and stayed with him during the trial, right? I never did see her. We our paths never crossed. Um, because I was kind of in work mode, but I know she was she was there. Right. 
And, and he traveled frequently with Maggie on work trips, didn't he? Yes, sir. And he would take his family to conventions and when they would have work, right? As far as I know, yes, sir. And Alan wasn't the type of guy that would go off on a guy's trip. His trips were family trips. I mean, I don't know that without a shadow of a doubt, but, you know, I'm sh I know a lot of his trips were family related, something with him and Maggie, or him and Maggie and the boys and their significant others. Right. And, um, and, and he was real close with Maggie's family, too, wasn't he? Yes, it, it appeared that they were very close. And if Mr. Brandstatter's, Maggie's dad, couldn't get in touch with Alec on his cell phone, he, he would call you and ask, Where, where's Alec? Yeah, he would call myself or Christy and say, hey, can you get Alec to give me a call? Yeah. And, um, and they communicated quite frequently, didn't they? They did. And, and did you meet Mr. and Ms. Brandstatter? Um, I didn't meet them until, I don't, we had a, Mr. Randolph was, he got the, Oh, Order the Palmetto? Yeah, and that's when I met them. That was the first time I'd ever met Maggie's fan, um, parents. The, um, and um, if Alec was in even a deposition, and if Maggie or Paul or Buster would call, I mean, he would walk out and take the call, wouldn't he? I never was present with them. I've, I've heard rumors of such, but I, I was never present with him at depositions and mediations. Well, in the office, if he was in a meeting, he, he would always oh, yeah. take their calls. Wouldn't Absolutely. He? Yes. Never say, oh, gosh, you know, tell her I'd call her back. He'd no, he her back. no, he never put off calls with his family. He always talked. Now, um, you were talking about the night that you learn that Maggie and Paul were murdered, that you thought when you first got the call that it was about Mr. Randolph. Correct. And we're talking about Mr. Randolph murder. That's correct. Alex and Randy's dad. Yes, sir. Because it was well known that, that he had just been put back in the hospital and, and his condition was not well. Yeah, it was my understanding that at that point the family was making arrangements to bring him home and and hospice may be involved. And so, obviously, we were all expecting awful news. And, and he, in fact, did die on Thursday, June 10th, I believe. I believe so, too, yes, sir. Right. And, um, and, and after that, you, you said that, um, you know, the, the whole law firm rallied around not just Alec, but Alec and Randy and their, their families. Absolutely. Okay. And, and, that's and we what, rallied around each other because we were, we were scared, we were worried. Right. And then, then after, um, well, I, I guess there was like a uh, tidal wave of media surrounding the law firm at some point in time, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And um, and so y'all had to. You know, be careful with comings and goings, and, and, and that was kind of scary, I take it. It was. We ended up having to lock the front door because they would just walk in and just overwhelm the receptionist. So it was, it was, um, came in like a daily habit there for a few weeks. So we had to end up locking the door. And, and as a result of Maggie and Paul's tragic murder, Alec Murdoch became front and center of a media spotlight, didn't he? He did, yes, sir. And it wasn't, I mean, that, and there were cameras outside the court, outside the office frequently, right? There were, yes, sir. And there were cameras out at Moselle? I think so. I didn't go out there, but I'm assuming they probably were. And all the buzz was about Alec Murdoch and what happened to Maggie and Paul, right? Yes, sir. And all the while you, you were around Alec on occasion and you noticed his demeanor and he was grieving greatly, was he not? He was grieving and he was also very humble. He had, 
he had changed dramatically. Um, I, you know, afterwards he was more mellow and he would come in in the mornings and instead of yelling Christy in it and telling us what to do, he would actually come to our desk and, and say hello and check on us and we would in turn check on him. So he, um, he was very different after the murders. And, and he had a hard time working after the murders? Absolutely, yeah, I, as you could imagine. Sure. And, you, and you're aware, and you had to keep up with his whereabouts, but he spent a lot of time with Maggie and um, Maggie's parents? Yeah, he would tell me that. He would, had weekend plans, and, he would, and I would hear him on the phone with, with his in-laws and making plans to meet up for the weekend. And he, he stayed in Somerville a good bit with Buster, with Maggie's parents? As far as I know, yes, sir. And he, he, and, he and Buster traveled um, up to the upstate, to Lake Kiwi or something? Are you aware of that? I remember him saying, you know, they, the family had, um, had property or something up there, his in-laws, and they were all getting together. And, and you're aware that Alec would not spend a single night after Maggie and Paul were murdered at Moselle? Yes, sir. I knew that. And when he was working in Hampton, he was either commuting from Somerville at a stove or staying with his brother Randy <coughs> or something like that. I knew he was either staying with family or you know he was coming back from Somerville from or Greenville from be, being with the in-laws but um, that's all I knew. But he never spent one night more at Moselle? Not as far as I know yes sir. Now you were asked questions about Mr. Waters about um, the fairest matter was the furthest thing from your mind after murder of Maggie and Paul, right? Yes, sir. And, and that you didn't do any more about that after Maggie and Paul's murder, right? That's correct. But I think you also said that, that, you'd, that you'd conveyed your concerns to Jeannie Seconder and that she essentially took over. That, yes, when I gave it to her, I knew she, would, she told me she would take it from there. And so I know she was, I gave it to her and that was that. And so there's really nothing more for you to do on the Ferris matter because you, after you turned it over to Jeannie, right? Correct. Okay. And then you um, were in this <clears throat> Alex office one day looking for a file and you stumbled across this canceled check. Yes, right? sir. It must have been underneath this, the file I wanted in between that and something else. So when I lifted my file, it fluttered to the floor. And the um, and and you felt I think you talked to this jury about how how this whole thing put you in a bad spot. And your daughter said you need to uh, dust your resume off or something like that. That's right? correct. Yes, sir. I was worried. I was hoping I was wrong. I was hoping that my gut feeling was wrong and that what I was looking at was not money being stolen and that he was not doing that. I was hoping I was wrong, but at the same time, I was scared to turn it in because what if they, you know, look into it and it's nothing, there's nothing going on and, and then, you know, it, it disturbs the relationship we had working together and, you know, what would I do? Would I be able to stay at the firm after turning him in on something so bad that he could lose his job over it? So I was, I was concerned. I was concerned for my livelihood. I'm a single mom with a teenage daughter. And, and nothing happened to your job, right? No, sir. Nothing happened to my job. It's just Alec who lost his job, right? Yes, sir. That's correct. And, um, and you, you mentioned in what's in evidence as defendant's exhibit number 441 is a text that you received from Alec, right? That's correct. And it's, it's, was it just to you or was it you and? Um, Me and Christy, his Christy, other secretary. The other secretary. And the date is Sunday, September 26th at 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon? Yes, sir. And, and you mentioned it was from rehab? Yes, as far as I knew it was, a, it was rehab. I assumed it was probably one of the steps of reaching out to those that you, you hurt and telling them you're sorry. And Alec was in rehab? Yes, sir, as far as I know he was. Okay. And I, I want you to read this to the jury, the whole email, if you don't mind, okay. please. Okay, sure. 
Hey, it's Ellie. I'm finally feeling a little better each day. I'm over the worst, but still feel like I have the flu. Real weak. I have been worried about y'all, and I'm sorry I didn't get to tell y'all myself. I know both of you have been hurt badly by me. I know it sounds hollow, but I am truly sorry. The better I get, the more guilt I have. I have an awful lot to try to make right when I get out of here. The worst part is knowing I did the most damage to those I love the most. I'm not real sure how I let myself get where I did. I'm committed to getting better and hope to mend as many relationships as I can. You both are special people and important to me. Please know how sorry I am to have made you part of my misdeeds. I hope you are doing as well as possible. I love you very much. Please tell Cheryl and Haley hello, and I'm sorry. All my love. Thank you. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Anything further? Very quickly, Your Honor. Mr. Griffin asked you about whether or not you were worried about losing your job over these Ferris fees. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then he asked you the defendant lost his job, right? That's correct. After the murders, but before September, the defendant still had his job, didn't he? Yes, he did. He still had his law license, didn't he? Yes, sir. You said, in response to defense counsel's question, that people came to him if they needed something, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Yes, sir. He was trusted by everybody, and they knew that if they needed something, all they had to do was reach out, and he was going to help them. He was trusted by everybody. Did you trust him? I trusted him. Yes, sir. People came to him for anything, like all these clients right here? Yes, sir. He was a prominent lawyer? Yes, he was. One of the most prominent in the region? Yes. And all of that came to an end in September 2021 when all of that came out, did it not? Right. When I found the check, I knew that he had lied to me and that he'd stolen that money. Thank you. You may step down. 